Every week brings another flurry of people being censured, fired, or pushed to resign for some purported instance of racism, sexism, or wrong think. Harper's Magazine published a controversial letter signed by over 150 people, including Salman Rushdie, J.K. Rowling, and Noam Chomsky, warning that the free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of a liberal society, is daily becoming more constricted. One of the signatories of the letter was Camille Foster. He's the co-founder of Freethink, a media company that showcases social and technological innovations, a co-host of the Fifth Column podcast, and an outspoken libertarian critic of Black Lives Matter, cancel culture, and political orthodoxy. In this wide-ranging interview, Foster explains why he signed the letter on cancel culture, why he thinks that racism is not the primary factor for most African Americans' success or failure, and why libertarians need to be pushing individualism now more than ever. Camille Foster, thanks for talking to The Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. Thank you. Have I mentioned I'm Nick Gillespie? Okay, thank you. (laughs) So uh, I've wanted to talk with you for a while about a lot of stuff. And uh, part of this is um, you are a you are a black man who does not identify as black. Um, and we'll, we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But I was thinking, I guess it was late last year, I interviewed Thomas Chatterton Williams about his fantastic recent book, Self-Portrait in Black and White. And I was mm-hmm. uh, I was happy, although not surprised to see you pop up in the pages of that book <laughs> as somebody um, you know, uh, Chatterton Williams is, is I think, in a bold move that both is prescient and kind of ignored in the current moment where he was talking about leaving blackness as a category behind and embracing a kind of uh, liberal in the classical sense and also kind of a contemporary sense of liberal individualism. And, um, you know, and that the only way to get rid of, uh, you know, racial strife in a way is to deny it as a building a foundational block of our society. And, and of course, you came up in that conversation where he you had an impact on him. Um, more recently, Thomas Chatterton Williams put together, pulled together a bunch of luminaries, like 150 people that included uh, everybody from J.K. Rowling to a man named Camille Foster to uh, (laughs) denounce um, what, you know, a broadly, you know, uh, construed uh, cancel culture. Uh, This letter appeared in Harper's. Matt Welch has written about it uh, memorably at Reason. Can you talk, uh, Camille, about what what's the point of the letter and why did you sign it? Well, first, thank you again, Nick. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Um, This letter uh, came to me a couple iterations before the one that actually ended up getting released. And initially um, it was a bit more explicit um, in suggesting that this was you know, a dispatch from people who identify as liberals. I, I actually identify as a libertarian. Right. So it's yeah. a, a bit of a difference Which there. And I didn't part want of to your an problem. That's why you're talking to me. And we're, <laughs> we're going to talk about libertarianism uh, isms in, in a little bit, but please yeah. continue. Um, but the, Ultimately, the reason I signed it and my suspicion uh, as to the reason all of the other signatories signed it, most of whom I do not know personally, Mm -hmm. um, is because I had grown increasingly concerned about the climate that exists in the United States today. Um, I I perhaps have noticed it most in media. Uh, Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people in newsrooms all over the place and have heard a lot about the censorious attitude and atmosphere, the sense that there are all kinds of things that simply cannot be said anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I I, I hesitate to use the word totalitarian in some instances, but I I don't really anymore with this. There's a somewhat totalitarian feeling um, about the desire to force people to either conform to a particular point of view or endorse it. It's not enough to, to simply disagree quietly. Well, um, silence, places... silence equals consent or violence, <laughs> so right? I mean, so you, it, or both. yeah. Okay. So, um, and you know, one of the people who was a co-signatory, uh, was mm-hmm. Barry Weiss of the New York times. And we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, July 14th. Um, Weiss has just, who we both know, um, has just, uh, announced her resignation from the New York times opinion page saying that, you know, Mm -hmm. the atmosphere there is so toxic and poisonous, uh, that she's, she's done. Um, 
that's what you're talking about, right? Um, is it's, I mean, it's not, we, and, and I think we need to be clear here because there's, there's an interesting argument, a uh, counter argument, uh, that I'll get to in a second, but that it's not that you can't say what you want. It's that the minute you say something that kind of goes against a, a, a far left, really a, a kind of narrow consideration of what is considered, uh, an acceptable, acceptable viewpoint, you will be attacked on Twitter. You will be attacked, uh, you know, on the pages of the internet, the mm-hmm. infinite pages of the internet for being racist, sexist, uh, anti-trans, all sorts of things. Um, right. so it's not, it, it's not quite right to say that you can't say these things. And the people right. who are pushing for cancel culture say, we're, you know, we're participating in free speech. All we're doing we are we are voices that have not been heard before. We were locked out in the bad old days of three TV networks and a couple of radio, you know, national radio stations and things like that. And now we have a voice and we are coming for you, Camille Foster, Barry Weiss, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Salman Rushdie, another signatory of the uh, of the letter. Uh, you know, and J.K. Rowling, when you say things that we think are reactionary and awful. Um, Mm -hmm. why is, tell me this then, because, you know, I'm on your side and, and Matt Welch and I have talked a lot about this at, in, in reason context of, you know, that it's not enough to simply say, uh, you know, we believe in free speech and, but we also believe that Twitter, YouTube, uh, et cetera, they're private platforms. So they have the right to say, you know, get, get off. I just saw that rush V or, you know, uh, the Roosh or whatever the, the pickup artist guy was bounced from YouTube and was crying about it on Twitter. Um, I don't have a lot of love for him or his material, but I do believe that it's it's a bad thing when platforms start to narrowly restrict everything. We need a climate of free speech. I guess mm-hmm. I'm asking this is a wind up to say, what is wrong with the argument advanced by some of your critics, critics of the letter, who say, you know, cancel culture is a phantasm. It doesn't exist. What it's about is holding other people accountable for their reckless, stupid, dangerous speech. Yeah, a, a little bit of housekeeping here because I think some background is necessary. I'm I'm someone who's arrived at a place where I feel comfortable signing a letter like this, somewhat reluctantly, um, and and fairly recently actually. Uh, I've long thought that there have always been things that you can't say. Uh, in polite society. And there have always been consequences to be visited upon people who say those things. What are um, those things? I mean, what, what you know, um, I mean, with, in, and I'm in not the trying past, to, yeah. No, in the past, it, it could be any number of things. In the past, to simply advocate for racial equality, for example, mm-hmm. was a, a, a dangerous idea to, to say that uh, it is no great peril for people to be involved in interracial relationships right. um, was not was a dangerous idea. Yeah, and um, just as a side point, uh, mm-hmm. this that floored me. And I remember uh, going through this when when Obama was first running for president, uh, when he was born in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, about two percent of Americans, according to Gallup, approved of interracial uh, relationships. It only passed the majority in like the mid 80s. Right. You know, and now it's in the late high 80s, 90s. And it's, you know, it's it's the dominant, you know, by far hegemonic that yeah. nobody bats an eye, much less says anything publicly about any kind of interracial, uh, you know, however you define that relationship. Right. But within our, you know, within my lifetime anyway, sure. uh, you know, this sure. this is a big change. Yeah, yeah. And, and look, the fact that there are some headwinds to be fought by people who are advocating for important but unpopular ideas is not something that I am too concerned with. Um, I have, however, arrived at a place where I am deeply concerned about the scope of things that are becoming dangerous to say and the degree to which there is an obvious appetite for censorship and speech and thought policing, not just on the left, but on the left and the right. There is no consensus in terms of the kinds of things that each side hates necessarily, but there is a general attitude and a sensibility that says there are some things that are either too dangerous for you to hear or too dangerous for anyone to be allowed to say. What is, what's and exemplary? That, that scope and category of yeah. things is is increasing in a way that makes me very nervous. And I think the the authoritarian potential that exists in a climate like that, especially in the midst of a pandemic when, and I don't think this is crazy to suggest, it is very likely that over the course of the next decade, we'll have more government, not less. 
and it's very likely. I think that's the, the safest bet you yeah. could make. I mean, that's and, that'll pay off better than uh, treasury bills and greater entitlement spending yeah. and entitlement programs. So we're we're talking about a government that's more powerful and an atmosphere that is already inclined towards censorship. That is an incredibly dangerous combination. And the right to speak freely is the most fundamental right that we have. And when you get sort of official challenges to that right, you you probably have to have a culture that's a bit pliable. And to the extent that we're already seeing things, and I, I can tell you, Nick, I get notes from people, and I'd be interested if you do as well, I get notes from people almost every day in every walk of life who are expressing a great deal of concern and consternation about the degree to which they see things changing, they're encountering speech policing and and really kind of like cultural programming in context that's shocked them and in a in a way that doesn't allow them any opportunity to push back. What and are some I'm of concerned about that? What are what are some of the uh, you know instances that exemplify this on the left and on the right for you? Um, because again, you know, it is it's technically and and meaningfully true to say that like you you can say whatever you want pretty much, and if you can't do it on Twitter, you go to Parler. If you can't do it on YouTube, you can create your own <laughs> streaming stuff like that. But what you know what are, what are you talking about? And also. I, I, I want to drill down a little bit. You are not making an equivalency between what's going on, say, with Donald Trump and what's going on on the left, are you? No, but I don't. I guess we'd have to drill down and talk about okay. what specific things the left or Donald Trump are doing that aren't equivalent. So, so some of what, them might what, be equivalent. you know, when you know, when you were signing the letter and you're like, OK, I'm going to sign this note from people. And you are kind of an outlier because you're a libertarian as opposed to a kind of mainstream liberal. Um, mm -hmm. Or, or even kind of progressive. I mean, somebody like Salman Rushdie or or J.K. Rowling, for instance, and Barry sure. Weiss are, you know, they are kind of, you know, centrist, you know, uh, centrist liberals, modern contemporary yeah. liberals. You're not that. But what did you have in mind when you were like, I gotta, I gotta sign uh, this? Well, letter. first, that that diversity of perspective that you just underscored mm -hmm. was a principal reason for me to sign the letter. I mean, Noam Chomsky is also a yep. signer to that letter. Noam and I disagree on virtually everything. Right. Um, but what we agree on is the importance of a culture that is generally inclined towards allowing, being permissive and giving folks an opportunity to make mistakes. And the specter of there being genuine formal challenges to speech protections. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that Folks like Donald Trump and conservatives constantly bang on about the the prospect of their speech being censored on Facebook or other right. social media platforms, and the need for laws to fix this problem. Yeah. Um, and in a, a different sort of fashion, I know that polling has consistently found that younger Americans think it is appropriate to. Uh, outlaw certain kinds of speech because it might be offensive to minorities. In both instances, I think these impulses are understandable in the sense that they're discernible, um, but they're wrong. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, again, to the extent the culture, the cultural things occur first and they are perhaps presaging what may happen in in, in our political um, lives, then it seems yeah, very important Supreme to draw Court, a line in the sand. The there. Supreme Court reads the newspapers, right? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has been phenomenal over the past 10 or 20 years on free speech issues, uh, but uh, it's a lagging indicator, right? Mm -hmm. and so if the culture gets very um, kind of repressive, suppressive, restricted, kind of constipated, one assumes the you know, the Supreme Court uh, and laws will fi follow suit. Do you believe that conservatives are systematically um, uh, kind of uh, that their audiences are are shriveled up on on platforms like Twitter, or YouTube, Facebook? Or do you think they're kind of off in cuckoo land with that? I'd say that places like Twitter, at least in the way that I interact with it, and it's important to note that, you know, our experiences on these platforms are very tailored to us. Mm -hmm. And I have cultivated a particular kind of experience and it leans left without yep. a doubt. Um, and the voices on the left are the most prominent ones in my Twitter ecosystem. Uh, I, I do have a lot of libertarian-ish right. uh, friends and followers. Um, and I get a lot of that as well. But the things that are most likely to be amplified are the outrages that are coming from the left. 
Um, so I, it's hard to say yeah. um, in any sort of formal sense, but what seems important to me is, as you mentioned, conservatives have any number of ways to communicate with the public. And the president of the United States certainly doesn't have any trouble yeah. telling the public what he thinks and leveraging Twitter to do just that. Um, I am far from concerned uh, about any peril posed by Twitter and Facebook, generally speaking, um, kind of dealing with their platform as they please uh, in order to, to, to sort of regulate how uh, people use, utilize that platform. Mm -hmm. There have been some things that make me slightly nervous. Um, I think the instinct to have Twitter and Facebook serve as the, the arbiters of what is true and mm -hmm. factual um, I think is a real problem and has all sorts of uh, dangers that people are probably not aware of. I think that the impulse to outsource our critical thinking and our mm -hmm. evaluate and the requirement that we evaluate the truth and accuracy of the things that we encounter is a really bad instinct. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's hard to figure out what's true. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. You're always responsible for that. You can't wait for someone to vox, vox explain things to you. Most <laughs> of the things that are important are going to take a little bit of effort on your part. They're right. going to be non-obvious. So uh, speaking of Vox, uh, one of the uh -huh. other signatories, and I guess this gets to, uh, you know, kind of the climate that we're talking about here, which is short of, you know, the, uh, the cop showing up at your door and uh, forcing you to the camp or anything like that, but <laughs> a, one of the co-signatories of the letter was Matt Iglesias of Vox. Yeah. And then a colleague of his, uh, who, who is a, uh, uh, a trans, uh, writer wrote, um, that, uh, or tweeted, uh, part of a letter that, uh, was that they wrote to, um, uh, to the Vox bigwigs and Matt is one of the Iglesias is one of the co-founders of the organization. I don't know what active role he has in the management of it saying that um, they did not want Iglesias to be fired or reprimanded in any way, but they wanted to make the management know that uh, they felt unsafe as a result of right. the letter. Um, is that the kind of like, is that a bad thing? Um, or is that a way of applying pressure, which is broadly within the realm of using free speech to kind of nudge and push and work the refs in your direction for the kind of world and the kind of discourse you want? Or, or I, you know, and I guess in another way, what, what is wrong with that kind of, um, I, you know, I, I, I could call it passive aggressive. I don't know. I mean, but like where, mm -hmm. hey, I don't I don't want anything bad to happen to this person, but I want the world to know that as a result of a guy I work with signing a letter in a different publication, I feel less safe at work. Yeah. Well, people people ought to have the ability to go to their employers and talk about the fact that they feel unsafe. I, I think what matters here isn't so much that it happens at all. It's the scope of things for which it happens. And mm -hmm. it's generally a culture and a climate that suggests that even trying to evaluate the quality of these concerns and the substance of these concerns is somehow uh, problematic in and of itself. And I think that that is ridiculous. Uh, I think it is obviously true that the letter that was written is not at all transphobic. Right. Uh, one of the principal complaints that I saw uh, targeted at the signatories is that somehow or another, because this diverse group of people with very different ideas all signed this document that they are not only endorsing the contents of the letter, which is pretty benign, frankly, mm -hmm. and, and uh, deliberately so, um, that they are somehow endorsing all of one another's positions, right. which is just absurd. And like you have on that sense. Rowling, of course, who is now probably more famous for being a turf, a trans, uh, uh, a trans exclusionary radical feminist, uh, according to some, then, yes, yeah, then the Harry Potter books, but also Deirdre McCloskey, a long term, long time contributing editor to uh, Reason Magazine, who uh, right. has been a contributing editor from the time she was Donald McCloskey. Um, right. And who in other contexts is, is, is held up as somebody who attacks people who question the, um, the, the kind of naturalness of, of being trans. So it's, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, we get into deep kind of 
waters pretty quickly. Do you think, you know, I mean, would you say that like the idea that that letter would make anybody feel unsafe is, I mean, you, you have trouble understanding the, the, the kind of legitimacy, not, not the fact of that concern, but like huh? what's going on in the same way that uh, black uh, staffers at the New York Times said publishing Tom Cotton's op-ed <laughs> about right. you know bringing the troops in to police the cities for riots that uh -huh. have not really taken place uh, or civil unrest that has abated um you know a bunch of new, you know new york times uh staffers said that black new york times writers are endangered by the publication of that i mean are you right. saying like th these are not so concerns and we should be we should be pushing back against the, that type of hyper uh exaggerated fear I, I, I generally, yeah, I, I think it's appropriate to be critical of those concerns, to ask people to substantiate their complaints. Um, there is nothing uh, un inappropriate uh, about that. In fact, I think it is the ultimate sign of respect to say that I will treat you as I would anyone else, and I respect your right to bring these allegations. I would only ask that you substantiate them. What do you mean? makes them right. unsafe? In what way does it make them unsafe? In what way does this letter make you feel unsafe? Ultimately, employers, people in positions of authority have to make determinations about whether or not they'll respond to some claims. Otherwise, you get into this arms race of competing concerns. And in a universe where we're discovering an infinite number of protected classes of citizens, we mm -hmm. seem to manufacture these things quite quickly now, um, the, the universe of things that you will not be able to say because protected person X has made a claim against you, which you're unable to challenge, mm -hmm. um, is just going to create a world but that is not only, not only boring and uninteresting, but actually kind of savage and dangerous. Yeah, well, but can I, from a libertarian perspective, uh, you know, and this is something I, I I, you know, somewhat disagree with some of my uh, colleagues mm -hmm. at Reason. I don't want to overstate that or misstate it, but isn't that kind of a libertarian world where we have endlessly competing private firms and platforms and voluntary organizations, which might be workplaces or commu online communities, where you're constantly writing your own line, you know, you're writing your own rules. And if you don't like it, well, fuck it, go, you know, go out on the prairie and start your sure. own, you know, I mean... But is I mean, is that actually libertarian to to kind of like I, turn every work, every workplace, every meeting place into this horrifying struggle session where it's, mm -hmm. it's constant purification? And if that is consistent with libertarian ideology, are, are we doing something wrong? Because you said, yeah, that it's a boring, uh, you know, boring and terrifying world if you can never mm -hmm. speak because you're going to fucking piss somebody off somewhere. Right. It, interestingly, I don't think I arrive here because of my libertarian beliefs. Uh, the, the fundamental libertarian value is this belief in a right to speech. Mm -hmm. um, but it is libertarianism isn't necessarily a philosophy from which you can derive all of your other values. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that a culture that is generally permissive is one in which rights to free speech are best protected. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that is why I place a particular value on that and think other people ought to as well. So I advocate for it, you know, yeah. in much the same way, I think you own your dog. And if you want to feed him, you know, shit dog food, that is up to you. Libertarianism doesn't suggest are, otherwise. Are you working in Personally, a product I'd placement? For or, care of him. Are you going to work in a product <laughs> placement now of like, you know, no, no, Blue I won't, Horizon I won't name or the something? Okay, <laughs> no. good. Thank you. <laughs> I won't do it. I miss yeah. the old, uh, you are too, how old are you, Camille, if I may? Uh, I'm 39. Now, 30 oh my god you are older than i expected but you missed yeah the, no, i'm i'm in extraordinary yeah, shape and you I are right you are you serious. know what i want to say <laughs> perhaps not as youthful as you but i too am youthful or so it's true told. I, I don't <laughs> get true. the letters of people saying i am being hounded out of work for slightly being off of center i get uh you know like you're doing you're looking pretty good considering you're ancient i'm almost 20 years older <laughs> now, which is a nightmare to think about uh but i was going to say there was a period in uh um, in sitcom, I guess the TV history, where for whatever reason, the networks wouldn't show actual brands. And so like on All in the Family, Archie Bunker mm -hmm. would drink cans of a uh, yellow can that said beer on it. 
uh, rather than like a Budweiser <laughs> or anything. I don't, I don't know what happened, if it was yeah. an FCC change or the networks realized they could do product placement or something. But um, so if you do want to do product placement, this is a privately owned and operated platform uh, you know, or podcast. So you can go ahead and we'll we'll talk about Freethink Media anyway, which uh, yeah. so you'll, you'll get to yeah. promote, uh, you'll get to do a little bit of business later. A lot of the... Um, you know, the, a lot of the arguments over free speech and what constitutes cancel culture, free speech, uh, you know, censorship um, revolve around racial grievances. Uh, you know, and this is particularly true um, in the wake of the pandemic and the George Floyd killing um, and then Black Lives Matter protests and whatnot. Um, you know, first off, what can I ask you? You you have a kind of idiosyncratic and I think complicated and interesting. I'm not sure I buy into it completely. A kind of <laughs> description of race or of the fictitiousness of race. Can you do uh -huh. a summary of where you're coming from uh, when you sure. think about categories of blackness and whiteness? I, I can try, and I'd, yeah. I'd be interested in knowing where you where you depart from me. Um, the, to begin, biologically and genetically, race is not a thing. Uh, there are populations, geneticists often talk about mm -hmm. that, um, and there are subpopulations, et cetera, et cetera. But the notion of there being races in the conventional sense, the, the way that we generally talk about them, blackness and whiteness of me being half black and half white, for example, or Asian, whatever the hell right. that means. Um, it, yeah, and is, Asian, by the way, is mm -hmm. the weirdest, or not the weirdest thing, but uh, I mean, just to underscore the, the kind of social construction mm -hmm. of these identities, you know, it mm -hmm. used to mean something in an American context now, uh, you know, which mostly meant people from China or from East Asia. Now it includes South Asians. So Pakistanis mm -hmm. and, uh, and Indians are, right. are Asian as well. And it's kind of like, uh, that's kind of a head scratcher if you went back to the, you know, the yeah. Korean war period or something, but. And the, the notion of blackness isn't much better. I mean, the, the abundance of genetic and cultural diversity that is subsumed under the label of black in, mm -hmm. in a way we, and we toss it around as if it's informative um, is, is mind boggling. So I begin there mm -hmm. and I begin with an understanding that blackness and whiteness are things that are born out of a historical context. Mm -hmm. And these are ideas that were designed to separate and categorize human populations, largely for the purpose of subjugation. Yeah. Um, and, and this is where, and, you know, Chinese and Indians uh -huh. face the same kind of governmental rules. Essentially, it was until relatively recently, uh, you know, after World War II, it was technically illegal for these groups to really become citizens as as immigrants hmm. to America and legally gain citizenship. So, yeah. So, you know, as, as a person comfortably sitting, so to speak, yeah. from the vantage point of 2020, it was a little more comfortable in 2019, if I, if I admit it, um, hmm. but comfortably sitting from the vantage point of 2020, um, I can say candidly that I've been able to live a privileged life in which my race has not been an obstacle in a professional or a official sense um, with respect to the laws of this land um, that I don't think I have any sort of obligation to identify on the basis of what many might presume about me with respect to my identity on account of my immutable characteristics. And I don't think that it's terribly valuable for most people um, for me to actually regard them in that way because we are at bottom all individuals. Mm -hmm. So race being phony baloney science, race having this all of this political and cultural baggage and in a contemporary context being largely a matter of like individual choice. The question comes to me, Camille, what, what are you? What do you choose to be? How do you self-identify? I see no reason whatsoever to self-identify on the basis of race and a great many shortcomings and drawbacks associated with um, reifying and propagating the notion of racial identity and racial difference as a, a profound signifier of great importance about the substance or quality or nature of any individual person. Who were your heroes, though, in coming to that? And do you, I mean, are you saying, um, you know, the, the cartoon version of that would be that you have a, and, and listening to you, I'm, I'm hearing echoes of earlier uh, thoughts by African-American writers and essayists, not just Thomas Chatterton Williams, who's your contemporary, mm -hmm. but people like Richard Wright and to a certain degree, James Baldwin. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Richard Wright, uh, you know, famously moved to France, uh, the author of Native Son, uh, because he felt freer uh, in a foreign country and was an existentialist to a certain degree. But also, I mean, who who are your heroes? Because you're making a kind of radical act of, of self-expression and you're kind of saying no, no to race um, in a way that race may not be saying no to you. But uh, so <laughs> first first question. Who are who are the people who helped you get to you know your articulation of of kind of this um, you know breathtaking really uh, individual choice of of self composition? Well, I'd say that James Baldwin is certainly one of those people, and James can be read in a number of different yep. ways, which is sure. why both um, TNC um, and myself uh, both sort of hold him up as someone who is incredibly influential and important. And to TNC their thinking. being Ta Nehisi Coates. Correct. Who yeah. you who and you don't agree with on very many things. Would you that's say that? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that. Um, and Zora Neale Hurston is mm -hmm. another person who's a, a real iconoclast and has had some yeah. very important things to say about race and race pride and the degree to which these are sort of limited ideas um, that are probably harmful to us. Would you um, say and, with somebody mm -hmm. like Zora Neale Hurston, though, uh, you know, who's best known now, mostly rescued by Alice Walker in many ways, another a black writer who you share very little with, I would suspect, mm -hmm. other than a belief in lizard Illuminati. Um, and, uh, but Zora <laughs> Not Neale true. Hurston, fake news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Zora Neale Hurston. Um, she was certainly her her life was circumscribed by race, don't you think? In in many professions. Yeah, she ways. also referred to herself as a as a member of the Nicarati, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, I I I concur that I've sort of taken parts of ideas from different people and. Uh, not because I am so remarkable, but I've kind of cobbled together my right. own philosophy around this. And I've been delighted to discover that other people um, have come to similar conclusions, really brilliant people like Barbara Fields um, mm -hmm. at Columbia University, who wrote a brilliant book called Racecraft, which definitely uh, comes at this from a different political perspective, right. um, but reaches many of the same conclusions about the perils of race and the degree to which we manufacture and reinforce notions of race um, every single day. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the general thing, if one only takes one thing away from this, is that what people need to bear in mind is the degree to which race divides us and obscures the truth. And the, <laughs> the last part of the trifecta is generally ruins everything. Mm -hmm. Like there are lots of important conversations that get hopelessly bogged down at, in all of the political and cultural awfulness that accompanies a conversation about race. Mm -hmm. And that awfulness, unfortunately, isn't isn't going away in the present moment. Yeah. Can I ask, though, you know, and this is kind of a factor and I'm going to I'm going to mess up his quote, but, you know, how Faulkner uh, in uh, one of his later works, actually, I think it's Requiem for a Nun, comes the famous line in the South, you know, the past, uh, the past isn't dead. It's not even past. Is that true about race? I mean, because and I guess, you know, we were talking about the racial grievances that are really um, kind of energizing a lot of the conversations about cancel culture and whatnot. Um, and, you know, Black Lives Matter is 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 a kind of ascendant broad based movement, um, mm -hmm. partly because of the, the police killing of George Floyd. But, um, you know, can we just how, or I guess what I'm asking is, how do we pay um, uh, like homage um, and pay the debt of a racially horrifying society and history? without necessarily perpetuating it going forward in the name of expiating the, the crimes of the past. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or I, I can rephrase that of like, uh, you know, how do, how do we, how do mm -hmm. we take account of the way that racism, you know, institutional racism, de jure and de facto racism are absolutely part of American society without then simultaneously maintaining that in the name mm -hmm. of, of, of getting past it. Yeah, well, I think there's there's something I've said, uh, which maybe I'll get in trouble for saying again here, but you know, racism isn't special. Racism isn't <laughs> yeah. racism isn't special. Um, the the fact of the matter is, to the extent racism has been uh, a force for evil um, in our society, it has often been weaponized by the state and by concentrations of power. And the fact of the matter is that. 
both in the United States and around the world, power has been used to disempower and take advantage of and dispossess various minority populations forever and ever and ever. And there is uh, an, an infinite laundry list of, sort of historical injuries that one could try to adjudicate. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad project, but I do think that there is another project that ought to be considered. And it's, it's really sort of the, the MLK project, this, this notion of um, a, a pursuing a situation in which we actually fulfill the promise of guaranteeing equal protection under the law. Where we're primarily concerned with that as our most essential value, and we're not necessarily primarily concerned about you know overturning the the meritocratic ideal that we're seeking, um, and in in favor of trying to redress all past grievances. Um, so you know I, I think that there's something important about recognizing the degree to which the contemporary. Um, uh, uh, disparities that we live with, that we're surrounded with, and that we face on a regular basis, like have their historical component. Um, it's perhaps more important from my standpoint to recognize that when we actually want to address and remedy these problems, the, the, the answers are generally not race specific. And the answers will likely not require us to do much in the way of um, sort of bringing in race or ex protracted conversations about, you know, several hundred years of oppression. Mm. If the real problem, just to take one example, is public schools that are failing many, many American children of all backgrounds, even if it's predominantly failing young Black students, then the solution is what exactly? Can we unblack them? Can we actually wave a wand and redress all of these historical injuries? We can't. But we can hopefully create a more innovative and dynamic school system that better serves and meets their needs. And I think those conversations actually just become fraught and a lot more difficult when the only thing that we can talk about is systemic racism and the this generally sort of convoluted conversation around like white supremacy and um, you know again historical grievances. I just don't think it's terribly productive. I think it generally fires people up. It gets the emotions and the passions flowing, uh, but it isn't obvious to me that it is a pathway to actually fixing these problems. And I what do about, think that it threatens that other project of you know equal protection under the law, which I think is not just a good goal. It's not just a sufficient mm -hmm. goal. It is a remarkable achievement that most people throughout most of history have not had the privilege of enjoying. Do you think George Floyd, uh, you know, and already he is kind of fading as a... Uh, uh, you know, as as the the focus of of uh, of energizing outrage and things like that, did George mm -hmm. Floyd um, have equal protection under the law, or or do black men in general? Uh, you know, we and we can talk about, you know, the the crime rate among black men is is elevated in certain ways, um, but then in others, for instance, in things like um, you know, blacks and whites essentially use marijuana. Um, in in relatively similar numbers, but if you're black, you're much more likely to uh, be arrested and go to go to prison for using or possessing marijuana. Um, so are we, you know, are we in a place where we have achieved equality under the law, or are we ninety percent there? Um, and you know, when you when you see a case like George Floyd, you know, it's a, for the since people started counting these numbers of police deaths. Um, you know, going back to around 2014, 2013, we see about a thousand killings by police a year. Uh, mm -hmm. Blacks are overrepresented, but the majority are whites who are killed by police. But, you know, are we are we seeing a is there a radically different law enforcement system for blacks versus whites that we need to attend to in the same way uh, that school outcomes are, are so different? Yeah, so to take that example specifically, I mean, there are definitely disparate impacts. Uh, and it can be said that in some context, it is obviously true that Black people and members of some other minority communities have worse outcomes than, say, their white counterparts. Um, but it's also true that this is complicated. Um, and it's complicated by a lot of different factors. People live in different places. We're actually talking about specific age groups of Black people and specific genders of Black mm -hmm. people. And even 
um, specific communities of Black people, when you actually parse, um, say, native-born versus Caribbean Black populations in different right. parts of Brooklyn, you get different economic outcomes and different crime rates and different arrest data. So these things become very, very complicated once you take the top off. And it does seem to me that with policing, uh, police reform and police involved shootings um, or injuries, the key question here is, are about, our key questions here are about transparency and accountability mm -hmm. and policy. And a lot of the conversation around, well, is it racism? Call it racism. I think that's, that's fine if that's the sort of thing that you're into. For me, uh, I arrive at, it's complicated. And more to the point, like what can we actually do to fix this to the extent we're fixing it, we're actually fixing it for everyone. And I will say about George Floyd briefly, and it, this makes some people uncomfortable and I think it's all the more reason to say it. Um, George Floyd's death is an awful and seemingly completely avoidable and unnecessary tragedy. Um, I say that seemingly because this hasn't been adjudicated in a court of law yet mm -hmm. and it's not enough to watch a video and you know, make an appraisal. What we want is a justice system that operates um, for police the same way it operates for us. Like you're, you'll get into court, we'll have this out and we will address the facts and you'll be punished accordingly. Um, but it should be said that people have died in similar circumstances who are not in fact black. And it's not obvious to me that we know with certainty that if George Floyd were something other than black, that he might not have died in an identical fashion. And that seems to me incredibly important uh, and worth keeping in mind the assumption and assertion that race and racism are the fact motivating factor in these situations, um, I think can obscure the degree to which this is a real police involved shooting and police abuses of powers uh, are generally real problems that all Americans ought to take very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, um, I think, blunts some of the more hysterical um, concern that's been expressed in certain sectors by people like Benjamin Crump, who's this attorney who always shows up at these events and who's written books recently about the campaign of genocide against Black Americans. Mm. It's it's absurd, it's hysterical, it isn't fact-based, and I don't see how it does anything but animate concern um, without giving us a real uh, sort of mooring in facts and reality, and I think that that matters. Um, the, uh, your your um, uh, kind of antagonism towards Black Lives Matters, can you mm. talk about that? Because And, and there are two there are two broad kind of things that we might call Black Lives Matters, right? There's a, an official group or a semi-official group, and then there is a larger um, kind of cultural current that says uh, that Blacks have gotten a raw deal and that until their lives are equal to, you know, treated equally as whites, um, you know, there's a problem. But where, where do, I mean, do either of those categories of Black Lives Matter um, reach you or are they equally off base for reasons that you've discussed? Well, yeah, well, I mean, I think for, for reasons that we've already gotten into, you know, I've got manifold concerns about something like Black Lives Matter. Um, I think injecting race into certain conversations where it isn't necessarily illuminating is a problem. Um, I think uh, exaggerated over concern about a particular imagined problem uh, is something that we ought to be concerned about. Um, and I think generally, you know, as a political movement, uh, what Black Lives Matter represents as a libertarian, like there are certain ideals there and values that are antithetical to my own. Um, it Can has we, become let's increasing. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about that because uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you now was uh, Joe Jurgensen, who is the Libertarian Party presidential nominee, uh, tweeted recently uh, saying, you know, it's not enough to be kind of colorblind, like we need to be, we must be anti-racist in our thinking. And you responded critically to that. What was wrong with her, with her sentiments that, that you bristled at so much? Well, she, she both made that remark about the requirement, the obligation that we must be anti-racist. Um, and then she finished that tweet with hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, and it's important to note that in 2020, uh, the the mantra Black Lives Matter uh, 
exists in a political context and is freighted with connotations. And much the same thing can be said about the notion of anti-racism. Um, when you ask someone what anti-racism is, they may not really know what you're talking about. I imagine the average person thinks, well, that's a, that's a pleasant idea. Of course I'm anti-racist. I don't like racism, um, but it matters <laughs> if you are aware of the program. And for someone like Ibram Kendi, um, who wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist or uh, White Fragility, which was written by uh, Robin, Robin D'Angelo. Yeah. The, the, the notion in these books, like, there's all kinds of fundamental things that one must accept to believe in and to abide by the principles of anti-racism. You must believe that all racial disparities are a function of uh, racism and that the notion of racism must be broadened from you know, the things that someone does that are in fact um, sort of uh, manifesting uh, their belief that certain races are inferior to others um, to this nebulous cloud of action and inaction and thought and um, subconscious thought, mm -hmm. uh, your mere existence, your actual essence as a person is your whiteness or your blackness and your guilt um, or your um, sort of condition as a perpetual victim are a function of your race. And these are sort of inescapable, uh, inexorable qualities of who we are. And I think that's a, that's a lot of, if I can be frank, bullshit. Yeah. And it's possible that Joe was unaware of that context. And I do know that she, she had a subsequent tweet hours later after a number of people got animate, animated about this. But, you know, while Black Lives Matter seems like, uh, you know, a fairly benign statement and perhaps in the minds of many people, just a very objectively good thing. I care about racial injustice and I want to do something like it. So I'm going to put this Black Lives Matter sign in my window. Um, but there is more to the program than that. And to the extent it, it and anti-racism are part of a broader program that is hostile towards free markets and capitalism, that is hostile towards notions of individualism and the scientific method, then these are things we need to be on guard against. And it is entirely possible for libertarians to build coalitions with people they disagree with to focus on specific policy goals and hopefully to attract people who care about those things, especially in an environment where Democrats are only paying lip service to these issues like qualified immunity, which mm -hmm. if you read reason, you know that Joe Biden has said he does not plan to do anything about qualified immunity. Right. I want to, I want Joe to appeal to people who care about Black Lives Matter on that basis. I do not, however, want Joe to uh, confuse or conflate sort of libertarian values with what is, you know, a hodgepodge of philosophical bad ideas um, by commingling the libertarian brand with Black Lives Matter. So what, you know, you are uh, you are a rare bird for any number of reasons, one of which is that you are a libertarian of African-American descent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the critiques. So, so are you, for, uh, I mean, in a very real sense. Yeah, we're all yeah. No, you know what, but not sociologically. <laughs> and, I, and I can point you to the update at 23andMe I had about 1% <laughs> unexplained of African, uh, it was a, North African. That's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, Those you know, tests so, are not telling you what they think they, what, yeah, the, what you uh, think that, they're uh, telling you. Uh, and trust <laughs> me, you know, when you, when you were talking about looking at subpopulations in Brooklyn of, of blacks, you know, uh, uh, you know, who are either Caribbean descent or not, uh, my mother's family is Italian and the Italians do worse than I, you are Caribbean descent, right? You're West Indian yes. or Jamaican. First generation, first generation yeah. American. So, my and this is, this is actually, yeah. you know, the, the original beef when Dan Hayes, your, your colleague and co-founder of Freethink <laughs> Media, who was working at Reason TV at the time, he was like employee number three of Reason TV. Yeah. He, he had met you and he said, yeah, I met this fascinating guy who is black, <laughs> but he doesn't identify as black. He says he's an individual. And so I was like, wait, let me guess. He's from, he's a West Indian or he's Caribbean. <laughs> uh, because I have I had encountered that multiple times and it's kind of an interesting yeah. exceptionalism. But it is true that West Indians... Uh, as a as a subgroup of people of Americans do phenomenally mm -hmm. well in New York in a way that 
Um, you know, if, if we talk about Latinos or Hispanics without breaking it down into Cubans and Puerto Ricans and Mexicans uh -huh. and Dominicans, or if we talk about whites and we don't talk about Italian Americans who to this day, at least in the New York area, have persistently lower educational outcomes uh, than other other ethnic groups. Uh, you, mm -hmm. I mean, this is what you're getting at, right? Like the parsing we, can go on forever, Nick. Right. Like and, you can and, you can literally follow it all the way down, right. and you should because the unit that ultimately matters yep. is the individual uh, and this not is these your, contrivances. You're singing my uh, tune of uh, Friedrich Hayek, who you know has his own problems, but believed in methodological <laughs> individualism. And you know that in the end, when you're talking about social analysis, it's the individual is the fundamental unit of analysis, not the group, mm -hmm. because those are transitory. Um, but um, so what I, what I was getting at, though, is that you are a, you know, you're a black libertarian, whether you want, you're perceived that way, whether or not you identify it. Why has the libertarian movement, uh, which, you know, when I think about it, and I came to this, um, you know, basically through reading reason as a high schooler, and a college student, and then as a grad student. And finally, you know, I finally got with the program when they hired me and started giving me a paycheck uh, many years ago. But, um, you know, it's, it seems to me that like the libertarian program of individualism, of capitalism, of, of getting rid of regulations like occupational licensing, getting rid of, de, excuse me, de jure segregation, things mm -hmm. like school choice, ending the drug war. Uh, these are yeah. all things that should appeal massively to minority populations, however you want to define it. But the fact of the matter is, is there aren't many black libertarians. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Because part of, you know, part of what Jorgensen and I think people who are, co she was quoting Jonathan Blanks, who was, who had worked in yes. Cato, who's uh -huh. African-American, who had been a, a Reason intern, and people like Radley Balco, also uh, now at the Washington Post, former Reason staffer who say, you know, liber the libertarian movement is pretty lily white. And, uh, you know, that's <laughs> a problem. Um, right. I, you know, wh um, why, why aren't there more, why aren't there more black libertarians? I guess that's what I'm asking. Well, first and foremost, um, you know, I think an evaluation of a group that begins with, you know, an assessment of whether or not you know, the, the phenotypic traits of that group are sufficiently representative and then makes a determination that, you know, oh, there might be a problem here um, or there is definitely a problem here. I don't I don't really truck with that. Um, the the reality is that libertarians have, uh, generally speaking, fairly low purchase like, across the populace. And that black voters tend to not vote for libertarians, but they also tend to not vote for Republicans. Um, they tend to vote for Democrats, right. and they've done so pretty consistently for years. The, the uniformity there and the rigidness of that support um, is, is an important thing to take into consideration. And I don't know that it says much about the specific challenges associated with libertarianism. Um, I will say that I do think that there's a, you know, an attempt to take a bit of a shortcut to try and get to and achieve um, sort of a massive support amongst black voters by, you know, hopping on the bandwagon uh, when it comes to these particular concerns about systemic racism and things like Black Lives Matter. Um, and one, I don't think the project will work is the is the important thing. And look, we're trying the experiment now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it will work. Um, well, can I, I think I that you can appeal to people on the basis of individualism, um, and it certainly worked for me. And I think that there is a certain amount of respect and dignity that you yeah. are awarding to the people you're trying to persuade when you don't presume that the only way to get through to them is by adopting you know, these, these mantras that also happen to include all of this racial essentialist claptrap. Do you think any of it, I mean, because we're really talking about socio, we're certainly not talking about biology. Uh, we're talking more about sociology and historiography, maybe. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one of the main figures in a kind of political libertarianism, and, and most of the stuff I think we would agree, we're talking about small L libertarians. We're not really, I mean, the libertarian party is part of that, but it's a, it's a subgroup of it. But it's Barry Goldwater, you know, Barry Goldwater, um, you know, he laid down with actual segregationists in 1964. He had voted for every civil rights law up until he was running for president and he voted against the Civil Rights Act. And he didn't just do that. Um, and most people 
who know him and his biographer, left-wing progressive Rick Perlstein, will say, you know, he was not a racist personally. Uh -huh. And in fact, in his public policies, uh, did a lot to integrate uh, uh, public schools in, uh, in Arizona when he could and the Air National Guard. Of, of Arizona and things like that. But he hung out with actual segregationists. He gave them, you know, aid and comfort. Um, isn't that part of the reason? And a lot of libertarians will talk about, oh, Barry Goldwater is my idea of a great presidential candidate. And he's a guy who was fucking hanging out with segregationists. Um, isn't that part of the reason why libertarians don't really, I mean, you know, they're, I mean, is that, an, is, is it like, so it's just an accident that, you know, within historical memory. Uh, and then you have people like, uh, you know, uh, other groups that are still around in the libertarian movement who talk about the Confederacy as something mm -hmm. other than one of the most God awful incarnations of human depravity. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that that's, that's an interesting proposition. And I've certainly heard that argument yeah. leveled, um, definitely saw blanks and um, probably Radley as well, uh, making some pretty loud protestations that it seems very telling that libertarians are upset about Black Lives Matter being endorsed by the, their presidential nominee. Well, I don't think it's terribly telling, except for what I just outlined, which right. has nothing to do with race. And I would I would posit that most Americans and most Black Americans included have no idea who Barry Goldwater is. I wish it were otherwise, but it is so. And the general notion that people perceive libertarians, perceive of libertarians as sort of broadly supporting the Confederacy or endorsing white nationalist sentiment, it's a smear that I encounter frequently. Um, but I would certainly suggest that most Americans don't have any experience with either of those strains of, yeah. you know, retrograde libertarian uh, heresy. Yeah. Um, I think that to the extent they've experienced any libertarianism in their lifetime, it's in hearing, you know, someone like um, Ron Paul and not in reading those dodgy letters, right. um, but experiencing him on the on the presidential debate speech, uh, stage and hearing him give um, both, you know, a credible articulation of what the ideas were in that context. Um, mm -hmm. and specifically condemning things like racism. And I think libertarians have a very compelling program, both in terms of its potential benefit to society at large and its respect for the individual mm -hmm. and people. Um, and it's, it's interest in dismantling regulatory regimes that make it hard for small businesses right. to operate, which is something that lots of black people have. And I think it's fair to appeal to people on those terms and to have an expectation that you can make progress. Identity politics is is a thing and libertarians can if they are so inclined to try to play that game um but it's a compromise that i'm not willing to make right mm -hmm. like joe joe has long odds of making it as president of the united states oh um, you're, you're breaking however, my heart <laughs> however my heart. the party will be around for a yeah. while and our d ideas will endure and the degree to which we're interested in diluting them and corrupting them um, or hitching them to, you know, some new fad. Like, I think that matters. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. And I'm not, you know, I don't want to be a Puritan for the sake of Puritanism and ride mm -hmm. this horse into the ground. Um, but I also think that the ideas are sufficiently important that someone ought to be defending them vigorously at the margins if need be. And I think that's what the Libertarian yeah. Party does. And look, we've made progress on important issues that are core to libertarians. And I know that because you've helped me to understand that through your own work, Nick. Mm, um, thank you. We, we own a lot of social issues, right? I, we were there know, before the liberals yeah, got there. For, <laughs> so. for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, and it's um, and, you know, it, it's. I, you know, of course, Ronald Reagan could say, you know, there's no limit to what we can do if, you know, we don't care who takes credit because he got all the credit. <laughs> uh, you know, or it's like, you know, when I'm always when people say there's no I in teamwork, but there is me, you know, so it's like, I don't know. But libertarians, it's it's somewhat frustrating, particularly in terms of things like criminal justice reform and police sure. reform. We've uh, been because, here. Yeah, We've been I mean, talking you know, about and, these things. <laughs> yeah. And also, you know, welfare, if I could just go off on one of my hobby horses, uh, you know, welfare reform, I can remember. 
uh, driving my liberal friends insane when I would say, you know what, the state, I, I, I don't, I don't know if I, you might be more hardcore than me. I don't mind the state giving, uh, you know, making transfer payments to people who need help. And, I, but I said to my liberal friends, like, get rid of stuff like section eight vouchers and healthcare, you know, Medicaid, uh, and food stamps and just give poor people unrestricted cash grants to spend as they see fit. And they would be like, how, you were, you're insane. You're insane. Like, how could you do that? And now we have people talking about a guaranteed minimum income or a UBI and whatnot. Um, so yeah, libertarians obviously are always and everywhere. We're clean smelling, we're beautiful, we're wonderful, and we're <laughs> so far ahead of the curve that we get <laughs> left behind. And we end up arguing against things that we were in favor of when nobody was in favor of them. Having said all of that, let me bring it back. The, fr the phrase you're looking for is clean and articulate. Nick. Yes, Libertarians that's are right. clean and articulate. Yes, as, uh, as clean and articulate. I get articulate, that all the time. Yeah, as, uh, <laughs> as, as uh, Paul's grandfather in uh, Hard Day's Night as well. He's an old man who's very clean. Uh, the... Um, um, why do why do blacks vote so overwhelmingly in, for the Democratic Party then? Or is that a meaningful vote to be talking about? And if I'm doing my uh, history right here, and I'm probably uh, misremembering some things, but Eisenhower and Nixon, both in the uh, 50s up through the 60 election, I think Nixon polled like 35 percent of the black vote or maybe even a little bit more. Reagan cracked uh, in 84 cracked double digits since then. I mean, Trump actually has done better than uh, than uh, Mitt Romney or John McCain did. Um, and I think George Bush as well. But, uh, you know, over the past 50 years, uh, you know, and, and certainly since the Goldwater years uh, where uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, you know, voted for Nixon, he campaigned for Nixon in 1960, campaigned against him in 68. Uh, you know, why do Democrats vote for uh, why do blacks vote for Democrats so consistently? We're in the 90 percent, you know, 90 percent plus range. And does that matter um, in the mm -hmm. way that you think about politics or power in society? Um, I don't know how much it matters uh, in terms of the way I think about, you know, politics and power. Um, I, I think one, it's it's safe to assume that they generally agree with them on mm -hmm. on many things. Um, I think two, it's hard for me to deny uh, what I observe, and that is that amongst the various racial groups that we have in America, um, no group seems to me more sort of determined uh, in its effort to kind of police um, in group. Uh, behavior and norms than blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, for me personally, I get a lot of you know Uncle Tom and House Nigga and all sorts of yeah. other you know, nasty names because I depart from orthodoxy. And you're not even in the me. house, right? You're not. Yeah. You're not wearing a <laughs> bow tie. I don't want to be. And, I don't want to play for the yeah. team. Yeah. yeah, and you're not. You're not wearing a bow tie and, and campaigning for Trump or anything or a right. Republican. No, you're none just, of that. Yeah. Yeah, but certainly to do that, you know, will get you all sorts of, of nasty behavior. So, you know, the fact that there is a lot of conformity there, perhaps a little, a little unsurprising for me. Uh, and I, I think about folks like Michael Steele, um, who was the lieutenant mm -hmm. governor of Maryland before he became an MSNBC contributor and I believe RNC chairman at one point in the past. Mm -hmm. um, there's an account of him visiting like Morgan State University and being pelted with Oreos. Mm -hmm. It's possible that that's somewhat apocryphal. But it isn't hard for me to believe yeah, they that were something like that is They were true. Hydrox cookies, actually. So, <laughs> so a completely different uh, meaning. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, and we see that in um, uh, Chance the Rapper a couple of years ago when Kanye West was flirting with Trumpism and said, you know, that mm -hmm. black should not black should not necessarily vote for Democrats. And Chance the Rapper, a protege of uh, Kanye, talked about his experiences on Twitter, which is where real life happens now. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of strange that we have you know, this empty planet, but we're, we're all crowding into Twitter. But he said, you know, his experience of growing up in Chicago was that the cops were terrible and the schools were awful and the city fought. Nobody cared about his neighborhoods. Uh, and mm -hmm. that he, you know, that Kanye was right that, you know, you shouldn't vote uh, Democratic. He ended up recanting those sentiments. Um, that's what well, you're talking about, he's, right? Although he's recently, as recently as yesterday, in fact, uh, endorsed this, Kanye this for president. nascent Kanye West campaign. Would for you president vote? Of the would, you vote for, uh, uh, would you vote for would you vote for President Kanye? I, I'll say this. It's a possibility. 
Mm -hmm. Um, But I do want to talk to you, Kim and Kanye, uh, about this run for president. I think I can be helpful. um, And to to the extent we can have a conversation, I not only would they win my support, I'm I'm confident I could help you garner additional support. I don't even think you could deliver your full uh, family vote. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'd be I, curious. I could. It depends on how, yeah. you, how you're talking about my family. My wife, okay. like my wife yeah. is going to vote for a ticket that includes me, okay. um, or even <laughs> a White House in which I'm likely to serve as chief of staff. I mean, I think that's my minimal requirement, which I think is fairly yeah. modest that's and a, responsible. So when yeah. we talk about a uh, presidential race, because you have, you have also uh, on the uh, fifth column, the podcast, mm-hmm. that, uh, what is that, like weekly, and you have a Patreon account where you're pulling in buku bucks now, so you have all kinds of special. It's uh, not enough. Never enough. Yeah, no. Okay. Well, now you're sounding like your hero, Donald Trump. But like you, you flirt with, or, I mean, would you say that you, or did you vote for Donald Trump or would you vote for Donald Trump? Do you think Donald Trump gaining a second term, would that be preferable to Joe Biden getting his likely only term? I mean, uh, Joe Biden has <laughs> William Henry Harrison written all over him. He's going to catch cold you know, at, at his inauguration or something and die 90 days later. This, he is, mm-hmm. He's a frail man. But Trump versus Biden, what do you see as preferable from a, uh, a specifically libertarian view? Yeah, well, you, you asked a, a particular question, did I vote for Donald Trump? Yeah. And the answer to that question is no. Um, would I vote for Donald Trump? Um, I'll, I'll answer in this way. Um, I generally don't vote. And to the extent I was to vote for someone, there would have to be a pretty damn good reason. And it's hard to imagine that Donald Trump would be able to muster the sort of miracle that would be required for me to go out and what pull would, the lever for What him. would be, that, what would he have to do? Would he have to <laughs> again, I'd probably have to personal <laughs> chief of staff? I'd probably have to be, I'd probably okay. have to be involved yeah. you need to be the <laughs> in, next in a way that I couldn't vein. be fired. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> in, okay. in a way that I couldn't be quickly fired. Okay. Um, so, so that's because, a no. because I'd at least have an opportunity to change things. But yeah, that's yeah. probably a no. But I will say, you know, in terms of the evaluating the benefits of a Trump presidency versus a Biden presidency, and even my somewhat notorious reputation for being someone who's willing to articulate the perspective that Donald Trump is miserable and awful, um, but he's not all of the worst things that you imagine. And in many respects, he like actually possesses qualities mm-hmm. that make him about as bad as some of our other recent presidents. Um, would you say find, Trump? I think that's a defense. Trump versus <laughs> Obama. Not much of a defense. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, would would you say? I mean, would would you grant that all of the twenty first century presidents have been awful so far? Uh, generally, in yeah. important respects, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, what what is it about Trump that you think he's not so awful, and what is it about Biden that worries you? Well, it, when I say not so awful, it's more so not as bad as you imagine. Uh, mm-hmm. For example, I don't think he's a covert Russian agent, and I don't think he is a rabid, determined racist who is using appeals to white nationalists to try and sustain his power. And I don't believe that racial grievance is what motivates the coalition that put him in office. But again, these are yeah. these are somewhat heterodox perspectives, but I think they can be substantiated. But to the specific question of you know Biden versus Trump and what the value proposition is, I'm I'm reminded of a conversation I had with Yasha Monk, who is the founder of a new publication, Persuasion, and contributed to the Atlantic and other August publications before that. Um, but we were talking specifically about you know cancel culture, a phrase that I'm uh, I don't love. I don't think it's it catches enough. It has too much of a mean girls feel to it. It's mm-hmm. easily caricatured, but. The, the notion that the left is sort of the force that is animating that, or at least that's created a circumstance where people like Yasha feel the need to leave where they are and start something new, essentially generally formalize this new center that seems to be emerging. Um, and Yasha took great pains to express a specific concern about the threat from the populist right. And it just seemed a bit at odds to me to note that we're concerned about this wave of of, um, sort of censorship and speech policing from the left because they've managed to, it seems, capture a lot of the elite institutions and to change the atmosphere in a lot of media organizations. Um, But then we 
still take great pains to talk about what is happening on the right. And, you know, I get that Donald Trump is the president of the United States, but in a future where the left owns both the culture and the presidency, that actually seems like something that might give one pause. Hmm. And I don't have a great answer to that. I don't know um, what it is. I will say that Donald Trump, uh, of all of his qualities, the worst quality is probably the degree to which he seems to be able to break people's brains hmm. and the degree to which the scrambling of norms, like I'd, I'd hoped that having someone who was as sort of palpably awful and kind of grotesque as Donald Trump in the White House might turn people off to like executive power and make them say, you know what? We can't trust government was, to do all that things. was a a wonderful 15 minutes when yeah. he was being sworn in and you saw in the New York Times and elsewhere like, hey, maybe yeah. we were went too far in glorifying executive power and privilege under Obama uh, yeah. because now it's in the, that hands, the, the grubby hands of this uh, yeah. you know, reality TV show star. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a real concern. One of one of your answers and to kind of move into uh, concluding, I would love to talk with you through the election continuously so that I don't have to pay attention to it. But <laughs> alas, something uh, the uh, memory of real life uh, intervenes. But one of one of your answers, um, both with the fifth column as well as uh, with your the organization you formed with Dan Hayes, former Reason TV mm -hmm. videographer, uh, 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 Free Think Media, one of the things you did, uh, you know, when you say like you worry about the left or anybody owning both political power and cultural power, is that you created platforms to speak. Can you talk a little bit about Free Think Media, what it is, and where you're at with it now, and why mm -hmm. um, why it's important? And then I want to, uh, you know, probably shoot the shit a little bit about the fifth column. Yeah, well, Freethink, and we just go by Freethink now, okay. um, is a media brand that is about the things that are likely to matter a hundred years from now, a century, um, several centuries from now. The remarkable innovations and ideas that are likely to change the world for the better. And we still believe that this is a remarkable, incredible time to be alive and that there's all sorts of amazing opportunities and amazing people trying to achieve great things. Mm. And we want to highlight that and celebrate innovation and talk about how we fix big problems. Um, I think there is a tendency to, to see innovative new approaches and especially amongst the mainstream media, it's regarded as serious if you are critical and perhaps mm -hmm. even a little bit cynical of these new things. Um, but I think so that what are what are some of what are some of the innovation specific, uh, you know, that you talk about in sure. your website as well as in the videos, which I think are uh, for me or what are most memorable about. Yeah, the, well, about we, we yeah, we specialize in video and yeah. I appreciate that. Um, AI, I think, is a yeah. great example. Um, I think in popular culture, you know, we're all familiar with the Terminator and various mm -hmm. other dystopian right. films about how miserable this innovation is going to be yeah. um, or how potentially dangerous it is. Um, but I think there's a phenomenal and super compelling story to be told about all of the promise and possibility associated with AI, the possibilities for medical breakthroughs, um, for breakthroughs in computing technology, and the many, many people who are doing their best to mitigate what many people imagine to be the risks of AI. Why and that's a, a productive way to look at that, even the, the sort of problematic side of this um, incredible new technology that is coming, whether we like it or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, that I mean is uh, you know is it might be the ultimate uh, point, really, is that this stuff happens whether we like it or not, whether mm -hmm. we sniff at it or or embrace it. Um, why do you think people are so afraid of the future, particularly technological innovations? And and does that fear you know is it related to uh, what you're talking about in the culture of people wanting to kind of strangle, um, you know, different opinions and, uh, and and anything that smacks of heterodoxy rather than some kind of new orthodoxy? Yeah, that's a that's a hard question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I suspect there are lots of reasons. I mean, I, I certainly think that with respect to computers and artificial intelligence, one of the chief concerns there is jobs. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the possibility that change is going to disrupt um, the, the situation that we're comfortable with in ways that we cannot control and do not understand. Mm -hmm. And I think that uncertainty alone is perhaps enough to put uh, a rather pessimistic, negative gloss 
on anything. So this uh, is the idea that, oh, my God, self-driving cars, it means I'm not going to be a, tr a truck driver or my children right. will not. I mean, you know, and when you were saying that, I was starting to think like maybe the reason why I tend to be and maybe maybe overly optimistic or uncritical, interested in new innovation and whatnot is because. God, I mean, my up through my grandparents, all of my on the Gillespie side, my father's side, the Guida side, uh, Irish and Italian, these people for thousands of years were yoked to the land because they were peasant farmers and fishermen. And it was only, you know, mechanized uh, industri industry and stuff like that that let them leave, you know, fucking farms behind. And, uh, the, and the, mm -hmm. the kind of glamour of that shift, which was totally because of mechanization and industrialization, hasn't worn off yet. Yeah. Um, what, um, what about the fifth column? What do you, what, what is success? Uh, you guys have a, a, a wonderful <laughs> podcast. You have a, uh, thank you. Uh, you, uh, you know, if you were a band, it would be, uh, you know, you have fans that are like fans of the velvet underground or maybe the grateful dead, but you're getting bigger. I mean, people who just follow you everywhere, even onto Patreon, a gated community, that kicks yeah. people off for things that they do and say that have nothing to do with Patreon, but you're willing we're to play that we're game. We're certainly you're aware of that. Uh, yeah. But what, uh, what, what would success, uh, what is success for the uh, fifth column? Well, I mean, I think it is, uh, it's quite an achievement that folks actually like listening to, you know, the three of us and our array of, guests and i don't think you've been one yet so i have to remedy not that. well that's well you um, know i keep hearing that but my invitation yeah, i feel no, i'm up here it. like uh, cinderella <laughs> up in my you know i'm too busy uh cleaning the uh cleaning the house <laughs> um but uh you know i think the fact that we've attracted an audience at all mm -hmm. is something i'm enormously proud of and and honored by um i think what we attempt to do is both um you know, exercise our, our own demons, um, have a little bit of fun in the process and take a, take sharp aim at the media and the news cycle and try to help people understand, you know, how the sausage gets made, why it gets made in a particular way and bring people in who can help us, uh, contextualize stories or explore the perspective that they were recently talking about and do it in a way that is, um, honest, in some cases forceful, uh, but welcoming. And I think like genuinely model uh, what good discourse look like looks like. And that doesn't mean that we don't have sharp criticisms and rebukes for people because we do. And I think that that's totally fair. Um, but it does mean that, you know, if you're willing to come and have a conversation with us, like we'll have a beer with you and or or a, a, a gin and tonic or something else even what a about harder. a non-alcoholic beverage i'm not yeah, drinking you can have an these days, so okay <laughs> you can okay, have an okay, odus that's okay. fine but you'll yeah. make fun of me for having an odus <laughs> no so it's well like, yes yeah. no one is okay. no one and nothing is safe so yeah. you will you will be made fun of but we also make fun of each other but i, I think that there's something something really yeah. great about being able to cultivate a platform like that where people can know they're going to get you know honest um, unvarnished opinions where we'll, you know, take, take some risks occasionally in terms of being honest and forthright, especially in a climate that has become accustomed to punishing people for straying from, uh, I, is it a right to use the word reservation? I think mm. it is. I'm using it anyway, straying okay. from the reservation. Um, and, uh, you know, adopting perspectives that are a bit more heterodox or even just asking questions that are completely legitimate if generally regarded as out of bounds. Um, so we want to have a healthy, innovative, um, complicated and funny and spontaneous environment. And I think that's one of the things to keep in mind about like speech protections. You know, part of what you try to do with speech protections and speech codes is make the whole world safe and rip all of the spontaneity out of it. And I don't know. It just seems like such an awful, barren wasteland. I don't know why you would want to live in a place like that. Um, you, you need a little bit of jostling from time to time. And you need people who are willing to, to traffic in dangerous ideas and to articulate radical perspectives, which may eventually win the day. Hmm. You know, so much about our current society, the things that we accept as like received wisdom, um, notions of equality, um, that we used to seemingly universally uh, celebrate are things that were promoted by radicals. 
And I don't want to lose those people because I don't think we've protect, perfected humanity or society yet. Okay, we're going to leave it there. We have been talking with Camille Foster. He is the co-founder of Freethink Media and the uh, co-founder of the uh, Fifth Column podcast. He is the future chief of staff in the second or third Kanye West administration. Uh, this has been the Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Please subscribe to this podcast at Apple, Google, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, or go to reason.com slash podcasts and check out not just the Reason Interview, but the Reason Roundtable and the Soho Forum debates. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>